infrastructure, the first unit budget of the Modi government, much anticipated, seems to have gone down well with the industry. The broader message which came through was, let's build India, build smart cities, build affordable housing by funneling FDI, build highways, build rural roads, airports, industrial cities, build urban infrastructure. The big question is, has enough been detailed for all the well-intentioned Build India plans to fructify because if we can kickstart building and construction activity, revival of the economy is a given outcome. My panel today to answer that question, Niranjan Hiranandani, co-founder and chairman of Hiranandani Group and also past president and CHI, Anush Puri, chairman and country head, JLL India, Rakesh Makkar, president and CDO, DHFL, we also have with us in the Delhi studio Gitambaran and CMD ADS infrastructure. And of course, I should be going from the extreme left to the right. So, Rajiv Talwar, Group ED DLF. And I also have with me uh, Neeraj from KPMG, Neeraj Bansal, and Shailesh Pathak from the Bhatia Group. All right, so the big question, I think, Niranjan, first question to you, and that's. You know, there have been many hits, some misses, but overall, has this budget been a little bit of a music to the real estate industry which hadn't heard anything in the last couple of budgets? Very, very happy to hear lots and lots of things that it's talked about housing. Uh, our expectations were high. They've been able to match at least 60, 70% of it. I think I'm very, very happy. I think they have made a dent into what they want to do. They have not completed the entire milestone. I think we need to do a lot more in order to get the 25 million houses that we need to do. But let me tell you, in 45 days of a government, I promise you I wouldn't have been able to do as well as he has done in this budget. So hats off to uh, the Modi government and the budget that he has done. And I'm very happy, as you said correctly, that they talked about housing so dearly. And they talked about how the common man is going to get an affordable house. Kudos to the government, but Venkan Naidu has a lot left to do on his own account in order to complete this mission. So I think we'll have to wait for the Venkan Naidu story in order to complete the entire limit of what we need to do to achieve 25 million houses. All right, so we'll get to the specifics a little bit later. Anush Puri, thumbs up overall from a housing real estate perspective and infrastructure as well. Absolutely, Manisha. You know, there's an ear-to-ear -ear smile. I remember, you know, on the last panel discussion that we had last week, just before the budget, I was saying it's been four years, I haven't heard real estate word sp spoken in the budget. And I think the first half an hour of this budget speech looked like a real estate bill. Uh, so there was a fair amount of real estate activity, whether it was REITs, private equity, affordable housing, smart cities. I'm sure we're going to discuss all that in the panel, uh, but I would give it a thumbs up. Uh, clearly the way real estate sector was announced and benefited uh, out of this budget. Now I'm sure the expectation of the real estate industry would be more than what he's announced, but clearly from my perspective, given that he's been in you know, government 35 days with little maneuvering uh, given the fiscal deficit, I think you know, he's done well in announcing the schemes that he has for the real estate sector. Rajiv Talwar, your reaction? Absolutely tops. Absolutely tops. That's it. I think uh, Anuja said it very well. I know the start of the speech itself talked about smart cities, affordable housing. That's didn't it. it. And I think what they've taken on is from India 1. It kick-started the economy, that this was the engine and the urban urbanization and housing, construction and real estate. I think they've gone back to that and it all goes very well for the economy. Given the constraints that Anuj has spoken about, I think the finance minister has done a very, very good job. Neeraj? I think clearly, I mean, like everyone said, you know, it's a, uh, I would say it's a very directional budget and it's yes. very right on intent and quite right on content as well, uh, yeah. you know, because I mean, only few things which one would expect, like even from a direct tax perspective, you know, that one would have expected more to get done. But Always you know, more of a 45 days. <laughs> <laughs> but 45 days is, a, I would say, is a, is a lesser He's, time as well. He also you know. has to meet that 4.1% fiscal deficit Correct. target. Kitabar, I remember last year, you came angry, upset and <laughs> very agitated uh, after the budget, but this time around I can see a big smile. Yeah, see uh, Manisha, we are doers in the industry. We want to be a part of this 2022 story. Great budget, I agree with whatever everybody else has said. Bang on. But we don't have time. Hmm. 2022 is just 8 years away. 
the shortage we are ending is not 25 million. It's going to be close to 40 million by 2022. How do we put up those houses? We need to look at that. Now, that is a reality which we must face today and start working on it. Now, whatever this budget has opened up is very well. <coughs> FDI in affordable housing, but it still does not encourage the private sector to go into that okay, space. Okay, so let's, let's come to that a little bit uh, later, Shailesh. First reaction seems to be very positive. Are you going to play, play the devil's advocate and say, I'm not that happy? I'd say uh, we, sh we should appreciate the linkage between jobs, housing and industrial and manufacturing corridors that you know the finance minister has, uh, has thrown up. Uh, a mission on, on low-cost affordable housing housing for all by 2022, 100 smart cities, and on urban renewal, I think uh, over 500 habitations, and particularly on financing of cities, you know, the PNDA, the pooled municipal debt obligations, as well as REITs, I think these are very great positives, so no devil's advocate. No devil's advocate today, so let's get down to specific, and I think the first one I'm going to take is a consumer-specific detail which has come out in the unit budget, deduction limit on home loan interest in respect of self-occupied house property being raised from 1.5 lakh to 2 lakh, a much-awaited and a much-needed change. Rakesh Makkar, tell me, I mean... Uh, the consumer has been demanding it, the industry has been demanding it, there's also been some leverage given uh, and some, you know, extra income in the hands of every consumer. Do you think that's a big boost to the demand for housing? This is absolutely fantastic budget. Number one, by increasing the tax limit, it leaves more money in customers' hands because a lot of our customers were struggling to make the down payment of 10 or 20%. That's one big positive. <laughs> Secondly, interest tax benefit, which a customer going to get because of uh, rebate, that's positive. He gets a rebate on principal. So housing loan, which normally he would take a 10.5, 10.25, he actually post-tax saving, it will cost him around 7, 7.5%, which is fantastic in a country where we have inflation of 8, 9%. This is a big opportunity for him to uh, have his own house. And we all know in this country we have a huge shortage of houses, to put the exact number, we have 19 million housing shortage in urban India and close to 44 million houses shortfall in rural India. So it's huge, huge shortage. So I think these are very, very positive steps by government. Alright, so more disposable income and of course tax benefits on housing loan as well. So these two are a very big positive. So let's get down to the that other big expectation which has been fulfilled to a certain level which is affordable housing. Nirendra Neva Nandani, you send us a paper that you'd recommended for the housing ministry in terms of affordable housing. Yes, there's been a miss. There's not been infrastructure status given to it. But everything else which this budget holds, you think... It's incentive good enough for developers such as you to look seriously at affordable housing now? Yeah. I think it is there, but uh, there are a couple of things which are missing more than just uh, infrastructure status, which was very important because we don't get long-term funding for housing. One was service tax. It's a quite an anomaly, uh, anomaly that uh, if you buy a house which is under construction, you pay 12% service tax. If you get an occupation certificate of the same house, you pay no service tax. Now, this is ridiculous. You know, and people who can't afford a house buy it on installments during construction period in order because they cannot wait for the building to be ready and uh, pay it in one installment. So I think some of these anomalies have remained. And I think once we get the totality in place and we have the next budget in six months, we need to correct these anomalies in order to see that the other end to end is completely uh, not missed. You know. So I think this is going to be extremely important. One of the other factors which I think have remained is the SEZ issue which really uh, is part of the reality sector. Uh, the, uh, the finance minister has we'll clearly stated that SEZ later. SEZ We'll come to SEZ later. I think let's just focus on affordable housing because it's a big dream and a big I, need for I, I the country. Okay. Uh, the taxation levels in case of housing is still not too good and I think we need to really look at that. If you look at the total amount of taxes that a ho affordable house has to pay is almost 30 to 32 percent which goes into taxes direct and indirect and I think somewhere that had to be rationalized also. It's not happened. Maybe when GST comes in that may get rationalized.
All right. So GST, well, he said that pretty much not set a date, but said this year has to be used to get GST rolling. Rajiv Talwar, would DLF get into affordable housing after this budget? Or I think there is another provision in this which will make everyone get into that. All right. Let's hear that one. That is that 30% yes. threshold level. I think some cities have already come into it when they say that make 15% necessarily For a over and above your FAR which you get. This is making it 30%. I think the kind of investment which is required will come in. There's the National Housing Bank, 4,000 crores which has been given for it. That will help it. The very fact that you said GST and REITs, I think what is the intent? The intent is that the commodities which go into housing and real estate will hopefully become cheaper. Mm -hmm. The cost of capital will also become cheaper. Therefore, what you are offering in a way should with increased supplies, moderate prices and therefore I think it will be in everyone's interest not only to cater to the niche market that they are looking forward to but also to provide affordable housing or what we would call you know, curse thing, CSP housing in very large numbers. Okay. That is the service providers. I think what you said was absolutely correct. There is directional clarity in this budget and that is something which we need to build upon. Anush Puri, you know, whether it's DLF or it's Hiranandari, most of these groups and large developers, even mid-sized developers, few of them have ventured into affordable housing for several reasons. The bigger reason has also been that They've been in an extremely sweet spot with premium and luxury housing. And now that sweet spot seems to be actually drying up, isn't it? So affordable housing is the biggest market. And if you can make money in it, then why not get into it? Yeah, and you know, Manisha, you're absolutely correct. I do believe that you're going to find your know, grade A players get into affordable housing. And I'll take one, one point why I believe that they will is because of the 100 smart cities. You know, these are satellite townships that are going to be built next to major cities. Now, these satellite townships would have the requisite infrastructure. We heard about water, sanit sanitation, roads, metros uh, that are going to be built up. But the most important thing is today why you're not able to do affordable housing in large cities is because of the land pricing. And hopefully with 100 new smart cities, when they're acquired, they're acquired at a lot more reasonable land price. And you know, today on an average, if you were to look at it, 50% of the project is towards the land price and 50 is perhaps the rest of it. Now that 50, can you reduce it to 20 as the cost of the land, given that these are new townships that are going to be created? So I think that's where you will find a huge amount of focus, not only from the Indian developer community, but also from international developer community because of two reasons. One, your FDI limit has come down from half a million to 200,000 square feet. And second, that this is going to be a lot more cleaner landscape that is going to come up. Equally, uh, you know, one other thing, Manisha, that uh, the finance minister said that he is not looking at these townships only as just residential play. He is looking at bringing economic activity into these townships. And that's what, to my mind, is a delight that these are going to be proper townships where there's going to be economic activity rather than just residential cities where people still come into the metro city and then go back in the evening to those residential townships. And that's where I believe you're going to find a huge amount of interest from the developer community to create the uh, real estate component of these new 100 smart cities. Mm. I, I could see you smiling and beaming because now you're with a company which is looking to build smart cities. So this you know, connection between the fact that once you have new smart cities where land is available at a much cheaper rate with the entire ecosystem, affordable housing automatically gets taken care of or it becomes possible for developers to look at affordable housing. Is the linkage that clear? Yes. In fact, let me give you a specific example. We are putting up over 10,000 homes costing less than 20 lakh. Between 20 lakhs, uh, about 10,000 homes in the next two to three years. I have a look at the site, and our uh, objective is to put up a, um, a million homes in the 20 lakh minus segment over the next uh, few years. We are evaluating Mexican and South African technology, and the Korean example is very fascinating on how they, uh, you know, upscaled it. I believe that uh, with uh, current technology. Uh, doing anything upwards of a million homes for a group like ours is eminently feasible. Gitambar, your first reaction and I saw in a press release was on affordable housing saying that it definitely incentivizes developers to get into that segment. See actually, uh, 
thing is, you know, just to put things in perspective, smart cities may not necessarily be new cities. Yeah. They are existing cities mm -hmm. which will have you know better Wi-Fi connectivity, better infrastructure. So they are existing cities also. They are not also. created in barren land and deserts. No, I mean, they are not. Just the Bihar is in Imrana. You yes. can convert all of these yeah. cities. Like they, they can also think of a Saranpur. You know, they can think yes. of uh, a Muradabad. You know, let's uh, to be to closer home. Is it's, that the way they will go? A smart city. Why not satellites and parts of existing cities? So the budget speech says smart cities and satellites and parts of existing oh, yeah. cities. So, so you know. We, what we need is, and I am saying this again and again, we need to look beyond the metros. This shortage of 44 million, I said 40 million, 44 million homes is across the country, even in smaller towns. Mm. So as an industry, we tend to not even see those. Even, you know, uh, when government speaks of it, they speak of... You don't see them, Gitanda, because there are no job, job opportunities. No, 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 I, I beg to... The system is much weaker than it would be no, in an NCR. No. There's a migration. Manish, I beg to differ. No, no, no. There's, there's enough job opportunities over there. I mean, we are operating in three or four uh, such <coughs> towns and there's, those people don't want to come here. And they have enough opportunities. So, for example, uh, Saranpur, for example, Bijnor, there's a lot of cane industry, sugar industry over there. Bulan share has got a huge... Saying, okay, so that's an, that's an opportunity. But don't consider smart cities as new cities yes. to even the yes. Okay. The PM, let me please uh, complete. The PM had, before he became PM, he had spoken of a concept of urban. That's a combination of rural and urban. Okay. So that is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the concept of a urban uh, dwelling wherein people don't have to actually move out and they get enough uh, employment where they are, but they need a good living space over there which has uh, sustainable infrastructure, but the private sector does not want to go there to do business. Mm -hmm. That is what has to change. Okay. Why must I go, or why must Rajiv's company DLF or why must anybody else go into business there because they would rather operate in the NCR or maybe closer to NCR or maybe in Bangalore, closer to Bangalore. Who go there? Now you will. Not really, no, I'm, I'm, already, I'm already there. But I want that all of us should go there also. So there has to be some sort of incentive for our industry to go to that space. Did the budget give you that incentive is what my no, question no, is? No, there are two. The urban mission yeah. and 24-7 power in all areas, including rural areas. Suddenly this mm -hmm. mega city is, instead of just mega cities happening, a lot of other non-mega urban centers will start happening. Will start. Which is where. Yeah, yeah that's what is where. Okay. Know, most of us are in many many cities all over India. I think we will find growths coming in there and affordable housing will very much be a part of it. Alright, let's take a quick break at this note. There is of course another big breakthrough which this budget was expected to give and has which is tax pass through for REITs which is expected to unlock capital for the real estate market and of course uh, allow the industry to also capitalize on office space and commercial real estate. We come back and examine that and other infrastructure initiatives which have been announced in this Union Budget 2014. Welcome back. Well, finally, I have a real estate sector which is quite happy after the Union Budget. The relief that the Finance Minister started his budget speech almost by talking about smart cities and affordable housing after several years or in fact somebody says four budgets or five union budgets did the word housing and cities actually feature so high in any finance minister's speech so on that note i think one big discussion point is what the industry had been waiting for which is REITs real estate investment trusts this has been an investment vehicle waiting to arrive in the country semi-notified in October 2013 but without the tax pass-throughs or tax benefits which would make sure that the investment vehicle is not double taxed this would have been a non-starter so let's get down to asking our panelists how big is this tax pass-through now for capitalizing the real estate sector Anish Puri your views so Manisha, not only that uh, the finance minister referred to city and housing, I think for the first time I heard the word real estate 
I was like delighted, you know, I could, you know, you could see my smile come up because he used the word real estate uh, in there. And then he obviously elaborated real estate investment trust and uh, he said is that he was going to allow that. And not only that, he then continued with the next sentence to say is that the tax is going to be a pass through, which means that it's only going to be taxed on the hand of the recipient, not at the, in the hands of the trust. Your question, how big it is? Uh, there is 350 million square feet of grade A office space. Uh, out of that, 100 million square feet can be rated out straight away. And if you were to put a rough estimate to that, uh, Manisha, it's about 60,000 crores, about $10 billion. And uh, you know, my friend sitting next to you there, uh, DLF, is going to be the biggest beneficiary out of the 100 million square feet. They have the maximum stock uh, that is possible for anyone to list. <coughs> All right, I did see some uh, up move in the real estate stocks today, but Neeraj Pansal, outline for us how quickly do you think now that, uh, you know, the tax pass-through benefit has been notified in the union budget, can SEBI notify the investment vehicle per se? Can they do it as soon as, let's say, next month? Is that possible? No, I think we, uh, you know, I mean, uh, first of all, of course, you know, it's a, it's a very welcome move and something which is long pending as well. Uh, from a SEBI perspective, you know, there are a few things which have to be done, you know, on that side of it because uh, uh, getting the pass through taxation was one of the very important parts of it, you know, to make it a kind of an active and a successful implementation can happen with that only. But there are a lot of procedural work which has to happen mm -hmm. wherein the SEBI has to come up with the guidelines back again because they were draft guidelines issued, yeah. there were notifications and there were people had given some representations around that as well. And there are some regular changes which are required in the as well, you know, to kind of ensure that we have a holistic approach towards the REITs from an India perspective there. And uh, also, uh, you know, I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, success which Singapore has had and some of the non-success as well in the Hong Kong and other areas as well, you know, somehow there are clear key learnings available in terms of what to do or what not to do. It's not a product which is coming for the first time in a, you know, in the world in the sense of it. Is it worry that it will be a non-starter in India? Because I remember Anish making this point that even at the start when we do launch REITs in India, it's not going to be a retail investor product is largely going to be an institutional product. product yeah. So, so uh, do you think that there, there is enough ground to see that REITs is going to be successful in India? Shabhi? Well, I can think of at least three Canadian pension funds who have been actively looking at the REIT space. Mm -hmm. So, these long-term patient investors want a cash flow mm -hmm. over a, a, a 20 or 30 year period. They would love to do REITs. Because the, uh, the investment style is different in that sense, you know, the, uh, the portfolio they are looking at is in the investment time horizon is good enough for that kind of a return to come in there. Will that lead to actually a revival of the commercial office space sector? It's been down I mean, down for the here. longest time, uh, you know, I, I've been speaking to your uh, commercial head, office space heads and they've said that rental yields haven't gone up in the last three years at all. As Amit said, there's plenty of space available and it was actually facing a downturn. I think this will give a big kick, kick start to that and as you said, there is a lot of sacrifice which has been made by those who are putting real estate assets on lease rather than selling them outright because you do get a maturity value which is I mean, reduced to about 3 to 4 percent or 6 percent at best when you lease out a space. I think those years of sacrifice would now be made up in somewhat manner. Niradhan Niradhan Nani. Niradhan Nani. you capital at a lesser cost mm. and it allows the common man to take part in the process of urbanization or spread of assets, completed assets which are available to a common man like units were earlier that you can go in multiple times. It takes time for a retail investor to get into REITs, isn't it? It's, a, it's going to be an institutional play for, for, for the first initial. For the first five years, four yeah. years, whatever. Once we'll confidence is built up, hmm. it's like what India has been waiting for over a decade. We've seen the examples of Singapore and other countries and now you wait for a decade, you get it here, maybe down the year, but the retail investor is far more aggressive than we expect him to be. Okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. I'd like to bring you in here. You know, we saw the trend that a large number of developers, because of the dump that they saw in office space and commercial space, actually started moving to residential projects. Uh, the projects which had been announced as office or commercial were then changed to become residential. Do you think after REITs uh, that trend will change and the herd mentality is now going to probably change towards more office space which India will need? 
I don't think it is going to be because of REITs that people will go to commercial space. But actually, it's because if we get the GDP to grow up and commercial requirements go up, then automatically you'll move and go into commercial space. What it is really going to bring about is an immense amount of liquidity to the corporates. I think the liquidity which was locked up in leasing space will suddenly become a liquid asset. You can mortgage it. You can you can do so many things with it and that would be something which would be worthwhile. And second, a large number of companies and corporates and individuals have been stuck with debt. A large amount of it is locked up in debt with banks. So suddenly you will be able to pay off the banks because you will be able to liquidate in an innovative way rather than taking same plain simple debt from the banks. You can go through the REIT route and that can bring about liquidity to the company and a large number of corporates which are illiquid at this point of time will suddenly become much more liquid than they are yesterday. Rajesh Makkar, uh, analyze the residential versus the office commercial space for us. Uh, you know, I have also seen whether it's financial lending institutions, private equity, just everybody other than maybe a few black stones who have taken some interest and big punts in office space, most <coughs> equity providers have also tilted towards residential. Do you think that, uh, you know, after this budget there could be a rethink on funding office space? Our own sense is that, uh, as Mr. Hiranandani said, it's going to be driven by economic uh, progress. If you see GDP going up and uh, we see more development happening, and we heard about more jobs being created, more investment coming into infrastructure. If the cycle starts rotating, I think then the shift is going to be there. Otherwise, uh, investors are going to look at uh, stability in houses only because we all know there is a huge shortage. So uh, the money keep going to, uh, going to get pumped into uh, uh, residential space only. That's my sense. Move then to infrastructure. Some of the big, uh, you know, announcements made on infrastructure, whether it's development of new airports, tier one, tier two cities, thirty-seven thousand eight hundred and eighty crores for NHAI and state roads. And the numbers keep adding up. I mean, on housing, Rajiv Talwar, you were talking about the numbers and they look pretty large. On infrastructure, 20, 20, 20, added, crores. See, twenty-five thousand crores just for housing. That's <laughs> Affordable housing, rural housing, urban housing. urban housing, and we've not even touched on the amount dedicated for urban infrastructure that's and right. for that's for enabling local local capacity. All right, so so now put put it all together. The monies which have just come in between infrastructure and housing, a great kickstart to actually lend that GDP growth number to or take it to 5.4 percent, Shailesh. Absolutely, as I mentioned, the the connection between jobs, housing, and manufacturing corridors. For me, one of the most most significant announcements was the creation of a National Industrial Corridor Authority based in Pune. And as you know, we have two large corridors from the Delhi-Mumbai corridor to the Amritsar-Kolkata corridor. <coughs> and we talked about the Vizag chennai and the Bangalore-Mumbai. Uh, so there is this very clear sense that we will have an industrial corridor and that industrial corridor will have cities, smart cities, which will lead to housing. So it's a virtuous cycle, as, as our colleague said, of construction, jobs, housing, better manufacturing. I think it's it's good news for the country. So, so it looks picture perfect, literally, Gitambar. But you know, it all depends on that one big parameter: PPP, public-private participation, isn't it? Especially the industrial corridor, the infrastructure, the roads. But the PPP model, especially in the infrastructure space, has just not worked in this country. It's, it has a very poor history, doesn't it? See, I would uh, not blame that on the model. I uh, blame it on the last decade that actually was really, I would say, not used effectively for policy. So even when any uh, roads, you know, the road, the NHI uh, PPV model didn't take off basically because there were certain anomalies in the operational part of the entire effort. This government fortunately has seen that and they are making amends. The taste of the pudding lies in the eating. So now let's, going forward, I'm sure because they know what the problem was and they are addressing it with the funds in place, with the intent in place, I'm sure PPP will take off in uh, the roads and uh, the airports. It's going to be very doable now. That's what I feel. Neeraj Pansal, it's that easy. There are, there are 
there are a lot of problems on the PPP model, and they're not all immediately fixable, are they? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, I think uh, you know, to me, uh, the public-private partnership is two words, and then, uh, and then there's mm -hmm. after that there's you know partnership to it then, and I think that's very clearly. Uh, so you know, far, there's been inherent distrust yeah, yeah. between both parties. Correct, correct, to correct. Begin with. Right. And, and pr private uh, private parties believe that they should take no risks and make money. Money. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So I think you know the uh, you know the important part is that you know that how do we uh, you know one is select the projects for a PPP, so are they rightly selected? And when you are going for a PPP, are you doing all to ensure that the pilot program can function adequately? And if there are on the way some challenges, which are right challenges, you know, which are coming up, what is being done as a partnership to resolve those challenges as well? Because I think uh, you know the uh, you know when you look at the highways aspect of it and some of the other uh, PPP projects which have happened, there are some serious challenges and issues which have come up, you know, for people uh, whether it's Sava, whether it's highway around that. And and some of this was that you know there was some estimation issues, some ways of the risks which are going to be there, and also from the point of view of the fact that you know that there were promises made in terms of you know saying you will get right away all along, uh, but then those parts were not completed. You know, and then he said you know I am not responsible for this. You got to complete this still. And, and again, I mean he's mentioned land. Uh, there is an intention by the government. Nothing was mentioned in the budget. It's a, it's a sphere. It's something which falls out of the ambit of the budget. The Land Acquisition Act itself. I mean all of this requires right of Cities require land acquisition. What do you think? numbers stack up fairly high. Hmm. I mean, we're just considering roads and highways at the moment. What about ports, airports, Airport. or land? Is most of the cases it's already there. I think even on highways, we just haven't looked at elevated highways. They're the only ones who work because the right of way is guaranteed that <laughs> there. You don't have to go in for land acquisition as such. Otherwise. I think the fair play would have to be both ways, from the government as well as from the private sector. We don't need players who keep on delaying projects and thereby keep on adding to the cost. We also don't need government departments which think it's a contract given out, every bit of responsibility is on the private sector and therefore let's treat it as an audit objection for every, every uh, you know, kind of turn of the page which comes in. But will you be willing to trust this government, Deepak Talwar? Uh, I think with the sheer number of projects that will be put into the market, I am sure that projects will come up, they will come up on time, they will yield results to private developers and by and large they will become a model to be followed all over the country. We haven't considered railways, ports, airports, inland waterways, then of course so water huge spring. number of announcements now we, we need some takers we need some takers to actually roll with the government on all those numbers and all those plans we come back to of course uh, also ask that one final question what do our panelists think beyond real estate and infrastructure did the union budget hold and uh, how positive is it for overall growth manufacturing and jobs all of it which go a long way to stay housing demand in the country stay with us The steps that I'm announcing in this budget are only the beginning of a journey towards sustained growth of 7 to 8 percent or above within the next three to four years. Don't expect everything to magically change with this budget. So, my big question, Niranjan Hiranandani, were you happy with the big things that were announced? Fiscal consolidation, that means that 4.1 percent target being met, the kickstart to manufacturing. What is it that excited you the most about this budget beyond housing? I think basically it was a commitment of the Modi government on the lines in which they have been talking during the elections and post elections. One, manufacturing, I think they focused on it tremendously and want to make it successful. Second, infrastructure, I think there is a strong commitment to infrastructure. Number two, I see a different way of handling the, the subjects in this year with this government as differentiated from the other governments. 
the statement made by Mr. Nitin Gadkari a couple of weeks ago or a couple of days ago talked about 170,000 crores of rupees of projects that he wants to do in all the sectors that he's looking after. You also got uh, Mr. Javdekar to talk about what he's going to do in the uh, environmental sector. So similarly, I feel that the budget may not become the most important thing that we are looking at and, I, and what he says is correct. It's only a step. So I'm looking for Mr. Venkan Naidu to take up from the budget to take further steps in the housing and other segments in order that whatever is remaining to be done, because you must remember land is a state subject, so you're going to see many states, so you're going to get the budget equivalent statements of housing sector, environmental sector, manufacturing sector and so on and so forth. That's what I'm looking for. Okay. Arish Puri, overall, what excited you beyond real estate and affordable housing? You know, the intent, Manisha, was very correct and very direct because four points that, you know, I can recall from what I heard. One was, you know, he was very clear on this retrospect uh, retrospective taxation and he was quite early in his speech, he mentioned, you know, which is the right thing if you have to restore the confidence of the investor community back and make sure that ease of doing business in India comes up. So that, that, that intent was very clear. Second intent on GST. You know, I don't think so any one of us had thought the GST will be announced and done because you know it is a state matter but he was very clear again directionally that you know we will use this year and at, hopefully at the end of this year it will be done. The third on the infrastructure you could see the initiatives and the focus that he was bringing back and back on the on the infrastructure he understands that if the country has to grow at 7-8% infrastructure is a big bottleneck and you know that needs to be uh, taken out and the fourth was really on the agriculture sector which you know we all appreciate and understand large part of our economy and dependence is on the agriculture sector and he and he did that and i would say a part of that and i was quite excited with that was the focus on education because you know, that is where our youth need to be trained and need to be bought up you know you look at your cut-off percentages and everything in the papers that you look at it, you know, 98% in, you know, Delhi and you can't get into any of those colleges. So, you know, he's understood, he's appreciated and, you know, he's opened all that to make sure that we are really right-skilling it. So, in my, my opinion, right intent with which he started uh, this budget speech and then continued through that speech. Rajiv Talwar, final word. I think we need to go through the budget speech. It's been one of the most comprehensive ones. It's touched upon every sector. So there's a joke going around that this was a 100 crore budget. Many, many projects are 100 crore. <laughs> I think it's much larger than that. Yeah. I think what we're really trying to do is to give a directional clarity and vision clarity that yes, if we have to leapfrog from the current below 5% to something like 8 to 10% GDP growth, then I think it's the right steps which are being taken. Every sector, agriculture, mining, infrastructure, social sectors, name it, it's there. The one bold step in each sector has been made clear. And I think mean, that's the way it will go that's forward. That's the reason why everybody is happy. Except I think retrospective tax, some markets were at least expecting it to be nullified completely, which hasn't happened, which was a bit of a disappointment. But the rest of it is good. The common man is happy. The tax thresholds have changed, so there's a little bit more disposable income. And of course, for the industry, there is enough. Niranjan Hiranandani, Anush Puri, Rajesh Makkar, Gitambar Anand, Rajiv Talwar, Neeraj Pansal and Shailesh Pathak. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me. Well, there are enough announcements by the NDA government in the union budget to spur the real estate sector. And of course, now it's incumbent upon the industry players to seize the opportunity and participate in the Build India story. There's loads. Affordable housing to 19 million Indians and of course, smart cities. For me, we just hope that next five years will unfold as the big bang beginning to fulfilling that dream of a pakka house for every Indian by 2022. Goodbye and many thanks for joining me.